throughout the history of our world, evil men and women have sought to oppose God's purposes. And standing directly behind human opposition, the spiritual forces of evil operating ceaselessly. And yet all of that opposition, and there's a lot of it, is to no avail. Because this is God's world and he's in control. Psalm 2 makes this very clear, some very well-known verses. The Lord scoffs at them. Then he rebukes them in his anger and terrifies them in his wrath, saying, I have installed my king on Zion, my holy hill. And we see that big picture in a micro scale in 1 Samuel 19. We have this man, King Saul, a man who has willfully refused to trust in the Lord and put his faith in the Lord. And so God has chosen a man after his own heart. David is the Lord's anointed one. And both Saul and David know it, but Saul cannot accept it. And so while David is willing to humbly wait the Lord's time and serve God's people, Saul jealously seeks to protect his own position by killing the Lord's anointed. And it's futile because the Lord's purposes cannot be thwarted. The Lord in this story raises up two human instruments to protect David, his friend and his wife. But ultimately we see that the Lord himself intervenes dramatically to take a hand to keep his anointed one safe and in all this there's a very great contrast between the antagonist Saul paranoid changeable restless and the protagonist David faithfully trusting in the Lord now Psalm 59 which was read for us earlier was composed by David around this time and it gives us a little insight into how he viewed things. And it really is a wonderful prayer of faith. David is afraid. He's obviously aware of the wickedness around him. But fear gives way to faith and trust in the Lord. Now, David's words illustrate, I think, the perspective that every believer should have when it comes to the wickedness of our world. They return at evening snarling like dogs and they prowl about the city see what they spew from their mouths they spew out swords from their lips and they say who can hear us but you O oh lord laugh at them you scoff at all those nations O oh my strength i watch for you you O oh god are my fortress my loving god now, I wonder if that's the perspective of everyone in this hall today. God's anointed is on the throne. Jesus Christ, great David's greater son. And Christ, of course, was constantly opposed, wasn't he? His life was sought long before he went to Calvary, but his opponents could not thwart God's purposes for his anointed one. Christ went to Calvary. He won the victory over sin and death. He rose from the grave. He reigns in glory and he's going to return soon. And the question is, are we allied to him in faith? Or are we doing what Saul was doing? Living in opposition to the king? Are we submitted people? Resting in him, trusting in his justice and his vindication, watching for him, knowing that nothing the wicked can ever do will thwart Christ. Now, remember, this uh, passage that we're going to look at, this does not guarantee us physical deliverance in every situation if we live for Jesus. Because we have to remember that David was a unique person in salvation history. He was God's anointed. He was a type of Christ. And you and I can't claim that. But I think what we can see in David's life is a great truth. That if, like him, we live by faith, submitting to God, trusting him, resting in him, then there is peace and there is joy and there is eternal security. The Lord has gone to great lengths. If you're trusting in him, he went to great lengths to keep you safe. He gave up his son Jesus to pay the price. And there's no greater security than the precious blood of Jesus. So keep these things in mind as we go through this interesting story together and, and just remember them now 
We're going to start by considering the two different human instruments that the Lord uses to protect his anointed one. First of all, the friend. Now, if you remember previously, Saul had tried, not very well, but he tried to hide his rage. Now, okay, he had thrown a spear at David, so that wasn't very well hidden. But that could have been written off. That was a one-off. Saul wasn't in his right mind. He was troubled. Ever since then, Saul had been very careful to hide his murderous intent. And he tried to kill David very indirectly by, you know, sending him off to the military front line and having him killed that way. It hadn't worked. Because all that had happened was David had been successful on the front line and his reputation had grown. So in desperation, Saul now explicitly reveals his intentions to Jonathan and to his attendants. I'm not sure what they thought. It must have been quite extraordinary for them to hear this. This is the hero of Israel, David, and Saul says, kill him. Now, you often find that um, the more desperate a political leader becomes the bolder they become and the rhetoric is dialed up and everything becomes louder and starker and more visceral. I think um, we're seeing that at the moment with a lot of very desperate world leaders and their actions become very, very much more extreme. And this is the case with Saul. He tells Jonathan and, and his servants, you've got to kill this man. And it puts Jonathan in a, a dilemma. He's a, loyal, he's a loyal son to his father, and he's the crown prince of Israel, and ordinarily he'd want to obey his father. But back in chapter 18, we're told he'd made a covenant with David because he loved him as himself, a, a binding agreement between these two men. Mutual friendship, mutual protection, solidarity. It's a little picture of the covenant that God makes with his people. Now, it wouldn't have been much of a covenant, would it, if Jonathan had just laid it aside at the earliest opportunity. So what to do? Now, at this point, David is not a regular figure in the royal court. More often than not, he's out at war. He's been frozen out of Saul's inner circle. So he wouldn't have been present when Saul gave the order. So David was totally unaware of the immediate danger he was in. And so what does Jonathan do? Well, he starts off by warning David to go into hiding. And the next morning, Jonathan will take a stroll with his father. He will deliberately pass near to where David is hiding within earshot while he talks openly about the situation. It will enable David to assess for himself what Saul's attitude is. And of course, it's a, a wonderful demonstration from Jonathan of, of the solidarity he has with David. He's a true friend. A friend who sticks closer than a brother. Now, this isn't just about friendship, mind you. Jonathan recognises in David a man of like mind and like faith. A man for God who was clearly being used by God. And so Jonathan saw how clearly totally wicked it was, how morally and ethically wrong it was to kill David. And this is a a fact that Jonathan is at pains to point out to Saul as they take their morning stroll. He has not wronged you. And what he's done has benefited you greatly. He took his life in his hands when he killed the Philistine. The Lord won a great victory for Israel and you saw it and were glad. Why then would you do wrong to an innocent man like David by killing him for no reason? Jonathan's not stupid. He, he knows that Saul sees David as a political rival. And so Jonathan appeals to Saul's political self-interest. Look, your kingship, it's only been preserved because of David. He's been very useful to you. You've been basking in the reflected security and glory of David's victories. So this is quite a smart way of approaching things. But more than that, I think it's downright courageous. It's, I think, what we call speaking truth to power. Jonathan's job was simple, to obey his father, follow his father's wishes, and any deviation from that was fraught with peril. As we'll see in the coming chapters, Saul wasn't a man of sound mind. 
So this was dangerous. And yet Jonathan is a true friend. He's a man of integrity and truth. Remember, this was costly. He was the crown prince of Israel. Humanly speaking, who was next in line? He was to be king. And it would never happen if David became king. But Jonathan is not a man driven by self-interest. Jonathan is driven by faith. He sees with spiritual eyes. He sees that David is a greater man than he. He sees that the spirit of God is with David. And so he's willing to surrender his own self-interests and stand with the Lord's anointed. He rejects the side of short-termism, pragmatism, self-interest, and he stands on the side of truth and righteousness, God's side. And that's always what the Lord asks of his followers, isn't it? And now you're unlikely to uh, win friends or favour in the world by standing for truth or righteousness, by living for Christ. And in fact, the world will actively reward you for not doing so. And the reward the world offers is conditional. In return for your compliance, if you're willing to sell your soul, you might even receive the whole world. But as Jesus said, we know these uh, words well, what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? Now those are the stakes. Satan wants you to prioritise things which really don't matter eternally. Your reputation, your social standing, your bank balance, your career, your leisure time, your libido. He wants you to prioritise all those things and in return, just reject the King of Kings. Christ offers you treasure which you could never otherwise obtain. Relationship with the living God, eternal life in glory with him. Something priceless, something wonderful. But it does come at the cost of yourself and all the other worldly things that so beguile us that we wrap around ourselves. Are we willing to let those things go, to not hold them close and to trust in the greatest of consolations, Jesus, our saviour, our Lord, and our truest friend, a friend even greater than Jonathan. Now, Jonathan had clearly weighed up this kind of cost and he's happy to stand with the Lord's anointed. And he's granted initial success because Saul renounces his desire to kill David. He solemnly vows to preserve David's life and David is brought back into the fold. And this should, should have ended Saul's persecution of David. I mean, after all, Jonathan had been clear and Saul had clearly recognised the truth of Jonathan's words. But the thing about sin is, sin is not something you can simply be reasoned out of Precisely because you can't reason someone out of a position they weren't reasoned into. Sin is rebellion against God. And rebellion against God is not simply a calm, coldly objective, rational decision you first make after considering all the facts and you think, I think I'll choose sin. We don't decide to be sinners in that sense. Sin is our default. It's our slave master from the cradle to the grave. And it's so captured our hearts that left to ourselves, we cannot help but sin. And just as you, you can't simply employ some sound logical arguments and persuade an alcoholic to stop drinking, no amount of reasonable, rational argument will ever in itself persuade a sinner to give it all up and to follow Jesus. Only divine intervention can ever save a sinner. And so it is that Saul's jealousy of David, though it's been suppressed for a time, soon resurfaces. And Jonathan's reasonable arguments do not hold sway for long. Yes, Saul does have that inner conscience that every human being has. He does have a sense of right and wrong written upon his heart by God. He knows the truth that David is an innocent man. And yet the trouble is Saul is a rebel at heart. Sin rules the roost within him. And no external argument is going to change that. If there even is a tug of war in his heart, sin will win that tug of war every single time. 
Not because sin is rational or reasonable or truthful, but because sin has captured Saul's heart and hardened his heart. And sin will always be the default. Now, what's the trigger for Saul in this case? Well, unsurprisingly, it's just when war breaks out with the Philistines. And David, yet again, goes out and has tremendous success against them. And he's the hero again. Now, by uh, this time, David has been restored to the old position that he had at the centre of royal life. He's Saul's court musician, among other things. Saul needs the musical comfort. Sin troubles and torments him. And one day, David is there playing his harp and Saul is sitting in his chair, an uneasy, restless, agitated figure. And he's playing with a spear in his hand which gives you an idea of his state of mind. And to compound matters, verse 9 says that an evil spirit from the Lord came upon Saul. Now, just for clarification, that is not a demon. This is an angel of judgment sent by God to bring pain and distress upon Saul to the point where he was absolutely miserable. You see, Saul had hardened Saul's heart against God and he was happy to persecute the Lord's anointed. And so now, judgment. God's judgment. Now you see, if sin had already prevented Saul from living a happy life at peace with God, from now on, God himself would prevent Saul from ever being able to lead such a life. If you like, it's a judicial hardening. It's the sort of thing we see with Pharaoh in Egypt who would not let the Israelites go, God hardened his heart. It's a fearful thing. It says in Hebrews 10, it's a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. It's a wonderful thing to be in the arms of the living God. But if you're against God, it's a fearful thing to fall into his hands. And poor Saul knows it. And with all these black thoughts swirling around, Saul doesn't see an innocent man, he sees an enemy. And suddenly he hurls that spear straight at David. Now, thankfully, David is no slouch. And of course, it's happened before. David is prepared and God is with him. And David makes good his escape, but only for the moment. Saul knows exactly where David lives. And so he sends his men to watch the house and to kill David the next morning. And this is where the Lord raises up a second willing instrument to aid David, his wife, Michael. Now, I may have mispronounced that. I'm pretty sure it's not Michelle. It might be Michal, but I'm going to call her Michael because it's my name as well. So Michael, Saul's daughter, Jonathan's brother. Now, she was evidently very different from Jonathan. She was not a godly woman. It's very clear later on in 2 Samuel, that she did not share David's passion for the Lord. If you remember when the Ark of the Covenant was brought into Jerusalem and David was there full of joy for the Lord and he was dancing and we're told that Michael despised it all and she despised him because she thought this is so unseemly, this is embarrassing, you know, don't, don't make a scene David, please. And uh, it's because you see, she despised his faith. She was essentially a godless pagan woman who even, as we can see, kept household idols in her possession. But though she didn't love the faith of David, she did love David. Her loyalties were to him. She was his wife and she had no intention of seeing him killed. And so she's the second instrument that God raises up, aware of Saul's intentions and the men sent to uh, watch the house. She warns David, if you don't run for your life tonight, tomorrow you'll be killed. Now, it's interesting. Even in her warning, you get a sense of Michael's lack of faith because she speaks as someone who doesn't know God. And we know how David re responded, don't we? It's in Psalm 59. Deliver me from my enemies, O God. Protect me from those who rise up against me, deliver me from evil doers, and save me from bloodthirsty men. I have done no wrong, yet they're ready to attack me. Arise to help me. Look on my plight. 
David wasn't obsessed with his own vindication, getting justice for himself. He looked upwards. His faith looked up to the sovereign God. He didn't panic. He gave it over to God, which is what every Christian must do. Now, fear is not automatically wrong. There is a lot to be legitimately fearful of in this world. But fear and anxiety, every last one, must be given over in faith to God. When everything around us in our physical eye line is dark and dangerous, we're to lift up our spiritual eyes and see God there and trust that he's sovereign and that he's just and he knows that he will help and deliver us, if not in this world, certainly in the next, and we're to trust him. And there's great peace, great joy in knowing this wonderful God of grace, knowing his son, knowing his indwelling spirit, trusting in his sovereignty over all these things. That's what we've got to do in these days. Now, of course, <coughs> Michael did not have that kind of peace and security in a tight spot. David wasn't the Lord's anointed, as far as Michael was concerned. He was simply her husband in great danger. But she was a practical, enterprising woman. So what does she do? Well, first of all, she lets David down through a window, presumably a window at the back or the side of the house, away from prying eyes, allowing David to slip quietly away under cover of darkness. And then she takes some of those idols of hers, useless normally, but actually practically helpful here. She lays them on the bed and covers them with a garment with some goat's hair for a head at the top. And so you see, when the next morning, Saul's men raid the house and they storm up to the bedroom to take David, Michael can say, no, no, look, he, he's ill. Look, there he is, he's in bed, he's fast asleep, he caught COVID, he's had his lateral flow test, he's really unwell, you know, he, he can't move, he's so tired. And uh, they swallow it. Now, it's a, it's a delaying tactic nothing more. And Saul is so deranged that he's happy to have his men carry David in his sick bed all the way to the royal court to be executed. And so when Saul's men inevitably return and storm back into the bedroom, this time they discover very quickly Michael's deception. But it's a crucial delaying tactic because it has brought David several hours at least to make good his escape. And although the uh, Bible narrator doesn't commend the lie, neither does the narrator condemn the lie. Because you see, although Michael's methods may have been dubious, she was doing what was right because she was protecting an innocent man from death and she was standing up for the Lord's anointed. And the Bible is full of occasions when God uses even godless people to do his will. This is his world. All things are under his sovereignty and He's not a predictable God. He, he sometimes raises up unlikely people who use unlikely methods to further his purposes. Well, when Saul finds out, he's furious. And Micah herself is possibly in danger now, even from her own father. Now, she doesn't have the Lord to rely on, her, of course. She doesn't have faith. She doesn't know the Lord, so she relies upon her own native cunning, her ability to think on her feet. And this time she flat out lies. Oh, it, it, David coerced me. He, he threatened to kill me if I didn't help him. Now it saves her own skin, but I don't think this is, this is a lie that can be commended in any way. And it hardly helps David's wider reputation in that place. But in the meantime, let's leave Michael and ask the question, what about David? Well, he's escaped, just. It has been a nighttime flight, and flight is the operative word. Every hour is vital, as David seeks to put distance between himself and Saul. So he hasn't dawdled. And by the time he does find sanctuary, he is an exhausted man. He's hungry, thirsty, emotionally shattered. But he's not alone. He has fled north, very deliberately, 
to the city or the vicinity of the city of Rama. And we know, if we've been following the book carefully, who lives in Rama? The prophet Samuel, Israel's great spiritual leader, judge, prophet, seer, now nearing the very end of his life, still revered among the people and still active. A school of prophets has arisen under Samuel's leadership. And we might think, well, he's safe now, David, because not even Saul would dare to challenge the revered Samuel. And we might think, well, if God is going to have to rely on human instruments to protect his anointed one, to achieve his purposes, well, Samuel's the ideal person. This great figure, this wise old spiritual mentor. And yet the interesting thing is that this doesn't end the way we might expect it to end. Because for a start, Saul is so far gone in wickedness that not even Samuel is any kind of restraint. All he cares about is getting to David. News reaches him, David's in Ramah, and even though Saul knows full well it's Samuel's territory, he sends his men to, to seize David. And secondly, when Saul's men arrive, well, Samuel doesn't pick up a sword or fire lightning bolts from his fingers. Saul, Samuel doesn't do anything. No, you see, at this most critical moment, when his back is against the wall, and it looks for all the world that David's adventures are coming to an end, God himself intervenes. You see, God can and often does use human instruments. We know that. The Bible's full of examples. The thing is, he doesn't need to. He doesn't need to. And sometimes he makes it very clear, in case we perhaps thought otherwise, salvation is not of man. Salvation is from the Lord. It's why the Bible is jam-packed full of stories of small, weak people triumphing, outnumbered armies triumphing against the odds. It's to make the point, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. And so when Saul's Praetorium Guard arrive to arrest David, they're arrested instead. The Spirit of God comes on them in raw power and they're helpless to resist. They join Samuel and that little band of prophets in prophesying. And what seems to be happening here is some kind of ecstatic state in which these men spoke messages they were given by God. Now what the messages were, we have no idea, we're not told. But it was certainly God's word going forth, because that's what true prophecy is. If you go on YouTube, you won't want for prophetic messages. The trouble is, much of it is little more than human speculation. True prophecy is divine truth given by God, and it's powerful, and it's effective. And Saul's men here are powerless to resist God's spirit. And so Saul sends more men. Same thing happens. He sends more men a third time and again. The same thing. Now you might think Saul would know a lost cause when he saw one. But no. He's so blinded by his rage and his terror that he will not give up trying to do the impossible. So he storms off to Rama. If his gang of heavies won't do the job, he'll do it himself. And yet before he even arrives, the Spirit of God comes upon him too. And he prophesies as he walks along. And when he arrives in Rama, my version at least says he strips naked and lies in an ecstatic state day and night prophesying. Now this is quite symbolic, because you see many, many years before, when Saul had first been anointed king, the spirit of prophecy had come upon him. And then it had been a supernatural confirmation of his calling and his kingship. But now it's the opposite. It's a supernatural binding. God simply will not allow Saul to touch his anointed one. God's spirit, which had once helped Saul, now haunts Saul. It's a double-edged sword. You see, for David, the Spirit of God empowers him to do extraordinary things. For Saul, 
the Spirit of God prevents him from doing an evil thing, killing David. And for those few hours in Rama, Saul, king in name only, is subject to the true king, to almighty God himself. And God's power is manifested, protecting David, binding Saul. Now that's the context, I think, within which we have to view this strange account of a wicked man like Saul prophesying. The people around who witness it, they can't quite believe it. It becomes a proverbial saying. Is Saul also among the prophets? It's, it's like saying, wonders never cease. It's the kind of thing you say when there's no apparent explanation for an event. Is Saul also among the prophets? Well, we know the answer. No. But it's God's power at work. It's God's power being manifested. You know, some people glorify in their spiritual gifts. And they make the mistake of thinking that the gift is some sign of their innate spirituality. And tis not so. Spiritual gifts are not the same as spiritual fruit. Gifts are bestowed by God and they can be removed by God. And remember, the Lord can actually cause anyone he chooses to speak his words. Do you remember in Numbers, that wicked prophet Balaam, who wasn't an Israelite, he wanted to curse Israel. And what does God do? God gives him prophetic words and compels him to bless Israel and curse Israel's enemies. He was a wicked man. And yet if you read a couple of chapters in Numbers, there's some of the most wonderful verses in the whole Bible. The Messiah is prophesied of and all out of the mouth of this wicked man. And in fact, Jesus says, doesn't he, that if he so chose, if it were needful, he would enable the rocks themselves to cry out in praise. I think it all comes back to what we said at the beginning. This is God's world. He is in control. The nations rage, the peoples plot, they imagine a vain thing. They try to defeat God and his anointed one, and it's totally futile. It, it doesn't make any difference. I mean, Saul tried as hard as you could physically try. Chapters 18 and 19 are a flurry of evil activity on his part. He tried every trick in the book to no avail. God had determined to set David up as his king over his people and nothing Saul or anyone could do is going to prevent that. And God's ultimate anointed one is the Lord Jesus Christ, great David's greatest son. And he was constantly opposed. There were many people who tried to kill him long before Calvary. And most of all, he was opposed by Satan because, of course, Satan didn't want Jesus to be the saviour of sinners. So he threw everything he could at Jesus, trying to get him to swerve the cross and not conquer sin and death. And none of it worked. And when Satan perhaps thought he triumphed, the very means of Satan's triumph was his defeat, the cross. The king went to Calvary, he died for sinners, he bore the punishment that we should have, he swallowed up the sting of death by coming back to life and today he's enthroned in heaven, he reigns in glory, he's coming back soon. It's all totally inevitable. It's going to happen. And the question is, will we get in line? Or will we resist? Now, there's a, an apocryphal story of the great Danish king of England, Canute the Great. And uh, Canute, so the story goes, had his royal chair carried down to the shore. And he sat on it and he ordered the waves not to break upon his land. And what happened? He got his feet wet. And uh, this is what he said. Let all the world know that the power of kings is empty and worthless, and there is no king worthy of the name, save him by whose will heaven and earth and sea obey eternal laws. Now that's a wise king. If only Saul had shown that kind of wisdom. If we think, like Saul, that we can somehow resist the Lord's anointed one, well, it's like we're trying to stem the tide it's impossible your knee will bow one day at the judgment seat 
every knee will bow. But ahead of that compelled bowing of the knee, there's a better way. It's the way I think modelled by David. Yes, a type of Christ, but also an ordinary man like us. And David modelled faith and surrender to the King of Kings, the King of heaven and earth. In the very final verse of Psalm 59, David says, You, O God, are my fortress, my loving God. A fortress. When you think about it, Saul was the man with the fortress. He controlled all the apparatus of power, the royal citadel, the soldiers, the intelligence officers, everything. But David, on the run, had a better fortress. God. He looked to Almighty God. He depended upon God. He rested in God. He, he, he left his vindication and his justice to the Lord. And can we not do the same as we wait for the certain return of the Lord? All the apparatus of power in our world today is all in the hands of the rich and the powerful, unaccountable people who have no love for truth, no love for God, no love for anyone but themselves. And we're so small, aren't we, in comparison? We're so weak. How can we stand? Well, it's simple. We remind ourselves of this. God has set his king on the throne and Jesus has won the victory over sin and Satan. It's finished. That's what Jesus said. It's all done. There's no point trying to stop it. It's happened. All that remains is the consummation of that triumph. And if we're trusting in that king, in God and his anointed one, there's no greater security. I mean, you can have your house taken away. You can have your health taken away, your money, everything. But if you're trusting in Jesus, there's no greater eternal security than that. You might have distress. You might be shaken. Like um, Jesus said to Peter, sifted like a weave, uh, wheat in a sieve, shaken up. But you can't be eternally shaken. Your salvation can't be taken away. So will we trust in this awesome God and his anointed one today? I pray that we will. Amen. Amen.